instructors say that if you can get through stellar atlas training, nothing will ever frighten you again. After almost 50 years of working with actors, her legend continues to grow. Depending on whom you talk to, she's a bully, a genius, a tyrant, an angel. The only thing it is, is that you act with your soul. You do not act words, and you do not act this. You act with your soul, and you don't have that soul yet. You don't, and that's why you want to be an actor. I don't blame you. That's why you all want to be actors. Because your souls are not used up by life. American Masters is made possible by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. With additional funding from this station and other public television stations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Marilyn M. Simpson Charitable Trust, and Rosalind P. Walter. I am not, oh my God, I'm telling the whole world, I'm not a play girl. I don't like to lunch, I don't chat. One of the great political statements that Stella ever made at that time was when she said, well, of course, I could live in any communist country, providing I was the queen. She said, life beats down and crushes the soul, and art reminds you that you have one. She never lets you go when she's got you. If she likes you, that's it. It's a life sentence. She inspires, she cajoles, she prods, she pushes. Three years ago, I think, I took one of her classes. And just the way she came down to present herself to the class was an entrance. It wasn't just come in front of the class and talk, it was an entrance. And Stella's whole life is a theater. Shall I tell you what I am? Yes. Guess. <laughs> I'm a Jewish broad from Odessa. <laughs> hey, Stella! Actors say that if you can get through Stella Adler's training, nothing will ever frighten you again. After almost 50 years of working with actors, her legend continues to grow. Depending on whom you talk to, she's a bully, a genius, a tyrant, an angel. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it! Ah, fie! There's a dream. I want something. There's an inner desire to express something that you can't in daily life. And actors know that there are parts of themselves that they haven't used. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. It's good, but it's not soliloquy quite. What, what actually soliloquy is, is to speak out the thoughts that are tormenting you inside, the inner thoughts verbalized. It's you are trying to understand your own thought. Okay, then what, then what should I um, pick what? as, as like a, a focus to... Um... That's a very, very, very profound question you ask, because every Hamlet is asked the question. I've heard it answered, speak to your other self. Speak to the Hamlet out there. But I would take an image of my thought, my mind out here, my, you mind, if you need that focus. Take it out there as if your mind were in front of you. Yes, a little lower down. I got up and worked in the class that first day, and she was so wonderful to me. Oh, God, when you, when you don't know anything, you're so brave. <laughs> now, I wouldn't dare work like that in front of her, but... But she would, see, she gave, gives you the courage to fail. 
I need an army. I am tough. I ask a lot. There is no kindness in my demand. There's simply, we're in it together. We got to fight it out. And you better do it my way because if you don't, you lose. So do it my way and stop it. I'll have your answer. Yes or no? You'll have it when I give it. You see, I have changed. Okay. If an actor came in dressed as you are dressed, he would be asked to leave the theater and not come back. Because I don't see that you would dare wear anything like that. For it belongs to you. It's your own, isn't it? No, it's not. It's you borrowed it. I stole it. <laughs> now... Now, you mustn't put anything on your body which doesn't feed the play and which doesn't feed your soul. Because you're not acting words. You are not acting words. That is not part of the tradition in which this playwright wrote a play. You cannot dress that way. You cannot use a bottle that way. You cannot use candles that way. And I don't want to be subjected to it. Do you understand? I can't get anywhere with you in the part. And I apologize for not being prepared. I, I accept your apology knowing that it will help you and that you will do a lot to change it. You did the Chekhov and you have the talent. What you don't have is a sense, which Americans don't have, of the style. Absolutely. And that you must achieve. I simply was brought up to be what I am. And I suppose it's coming over as being very theatrical. A child of famous actors, Stella's New York apartment is a Fifth Avenue fantasy, a gilded setting for golden memories of her theatrical roots. Part Venetian, part Madame Pompadour, it also resembles the opulent dressing rooms of a bygone era in which an actress received her public. Today, these rooms are alive with the presence of her late husband, Mitchell Wilson, and reminders of her spiritual teachers, the Russian Stanislavsky, the French Sarah Bernhardt, and most honored of all, a mother who inspired courage, and a father known as the Great Adler, star of the Yiddish stage. His Merchant of Venice was so important that the world came to see him. And a producer from the American theater asked Adler to do it on Broadway. And Adler said, I don't really speak in any other language but my own, so I can't do it on Broadway. The producer came back again and said, we will let you play in your language and surround you with an all-American English cast. And he said, no. And then somebody smart enough said, Adler, you owe it to the Gentile world. Only a few minutes of damaged film remain as a record of an actor who was a hero to his people. He specialized in parts which revealed the moral tug between good and evil, flesh and spirit. dramatic by today's standards, Adler's style came from the language he spoke, Yiddish, an emotional blend of German, Hebrew, pleasure, and pain. His great purpose was not to entertain, but to teach an audience of immigrants. Between 1900 and 1920, one and a half million arrivals turned New York's Lower East Side into the largest Jewish ghetto in history. 
Adler fed these hungry people a diet of great plays and noble ideas. From tenements, from push carts, from sweatshops came Jewish hopes and American dreams. And Adler, the great Yiddish actor, gave them voice. He believed that his courage could influence people. And so when he took me, the actor said, you can't coach her and give her lines to do and expect her to wait and get her cue. And he said, she can. And my first appearance on the table in front of an audience, I said, dort sind seine Nichtspitzes gerecht. Mit zu kein Wohnlitz suchen, als Gott ist schlecht. Weil Gott weiß, wo er zieht. In ihm sich schluft er keinem nicht. Weil Gott dort in sein Nichtspitz ist gerecht. At three years old, he lifted me up, showed me to the audience, because he was a devil. And they screamed because they knew I couldn't talk and I didn't know that I was a baby that was being trained, that was being loved, and he said, she can do that. And I did it. The force of Adler's presence set the tone for Stella's childhood. At night, after a performance, the house would explode with joy. So he would wake me up, and he would take me into this large dining room with other actors and guests and things, and he'd say, now imitate your teacher. And how does she talk? And I would imitate the teacher, then I would imitate gestures, then I would imitate this thing, and they loved it. In her early days, there were no formal acting classes. Stella learned on stage, under the towering influence of her father. He said to me, you're going to do young Spinoza. Now go to the library and find out about young Spinoza, and then go into the wardrobe and get your costume. Now that's really a very, very important story that he understood that a nine-year-old child had the responsibility of going and looking at the pictures and finding out it's your business. Stella's mother, Sarah, was the Bernhardt of the Yiddish stage. She and Adler were famous for their tragic scenes. Unhappily, their drama continued off stage. When Jacob left home for another woman, Sarah started her own theater and triumphed in a variety of roles. I had the opportunity of seeing the mother on her 90th birthday. Luther Adler stepped out in the National Theater in New York, introduced Stella, and Stella introduced her mother. And her mother came out at the age of 90, a tiny woman, and started to perform things that she had done in her repertoire. She played a 16-year-old girl. She played a, a leading lady. She played a character woman. And it was amazing to see this old woman step out and become all these parts. I was there that day. The Adler household, to borrow from the Yiddish, was like thunder from sunny skies. She separated from him at one point. He came to the house and he saw a light in her room. He went up and he opened the door and had a gun. And it was her son. He was a very jealous man. My mother once said to me, you know, when I met Adler, I knew I would be in love with him. She said, and I think that any woman that touches him will feel the same way that I felt. Her jealousy expressed itself by having to go to a sanatorium out of sheer pain. Her doctor said to her, Madam Adler, do you want to live or do you want to die? And she said, I want to live. And the doctor said, then you have to tear this man 
out of your heart. And every once in a while, she would say things to me like, uh, you know, darling, no, she wouldn't use the word darling. No, no, she would say, Stella, if you like a man very much, it's all right, but don't let it go down too far. That's dangerous. You can love up to here, but beyond that, there's danger. By 1920, Adler had been acting for almost half a century. Despite a crippling stroke, he gave a series of farewell and positively last farewell performances. In 1926, he collapsed, and his heroic age of Yiddish theater had come to an end. One couldn't accept that. Nobody could accept it. The audience couldn't accept it. The press couldn't accept it. It was, it was too big. At his funeral, 50,000 people lined the streets in an outpouring of universal grief. Even church bells rang out in his honor. I think he would be astonished, surprised, that acting could be analyzed to such a degree that you could give it to other people. It's a wonder that I hadn't gone mad. I told him I had once that time. I ran out in my nightdress and tried to throw myself off the dock. You remember that, don't you? I think it was amazing to see the development in the actor through craft, through technique, through work, through educating his body, his voice, his mind. But I think he would be astonished. Baby, don't. You hurt me so dreadfully. I'm sorry, Mama. Brought it up. All right, now. She's just had this big scene. You've heard it. Now you you want to stop it. You want the whole thing to stop. You want to get to yourself. You have words and you say them and then you stop and then you say them. But you have no action to say, I gotta stop this and she's gotta know the truth. She's gotta know I'm gonna die. She's gotta know this and I'm gonna tell it to her now. There's an immediacy about your work and whatever you say, don't keep any pauses, just she's got to know and she's too far gone. And you're going to make her understand. Make her understand something that's more important than what she's saying. Okay. Stella's vocabulary is precise. Now that's when she says her. action, she means the character's emotional objective. I'm gonna tell you what In this scene, a young man must make his drugged mother understand that he has tuberculosis. His action is to, to make her to understand. No! Why such a thing without consulting me? You're my baby. Tear Every yourself away my... from her because she, that's not okay. the point. Okay, yes. Okay? Yes. Tear yourself away from her because she's still going on with her own life and she doesn't want to hear about this. You. All of this talk of loving me and you won't listen to me when I try to tell you how oh, sick... Now, now, that's <coughs> enough. Not enough. I don't want to hear because I know it's nothing but hard. And if she doesn't want to hear, mind. darling, she doesn't want to hear. Don't wait. Go away from her. Okay. You understand? You have an action to tell her. Yes. And she won't let you. That's a okay. fight. All right. Okay. Come on. So continue the fight. Well, I don't Act want actively. Go on. Right, I don't Mama, want to hear because I know it's not. Fact is that the craft of acting has been developed into being like the craft of music or architecture. It is a craft now that can be attained and can be used and practiced by young actors it couldn't years ago. In the 1920s, Stella blossomed from leading lady into restless spirit. In London, she gave what would be her final performance with Adler and met her first husband, who would be the father of her only child. Back in America, she flirted with vaudeville and a new first name. Her search for identity made her ripe for revelation. In 1924, Stanislavski's Moscow Art Theater came to America and changed Stella's life. But I saw the most subtle, most truthful, most theatrical kind of acting. And I was stunned by their abilities.
Stanislavski's method was based on psychological truth. With the fervor of a convert, Stella trained with disciples at the American Theater Lab, but there was little room on Broadway for the kind of acting she admired. I didn't so much like going on to Broadway because you were picked up to play in another play with other strangers, whereas in the Yiddish theater, you always knew everybody. Searching for a home, Stella finished the decade as the leading lady of Yiddish star Maurice Schwartz. In this famous scene, Schwartz plays Tevya, whose daughter has just eloped with a Russian soldier. The Yiddish language is an extremely warm, emotional, and soulful language. And so you could express yourself more quickly without laboring on this rather puritanical English. I was playing, I was acting, and I was on Broadway, and I met a man who, Carol Kluhrman, I heard him speak, and I was overwhelmed at his knowledge, at his brilliance. Harold Kluhrman would become Stella's second husband. A fervent idealist, he convinced her to take part in a noble experiment, the group theater. The Depression had turned America into a landscape of broken dreams. Out of the ashes of these dreams came voices demanding change. Politics combined with art to create a golden age in American theater. People had lost their homes, their jobs, but not their souls, Clement preached. His group theater aimed to cultivate the American soul. Just as Adler raised his immigrant audience, now Clerman intended to do the same on Broadway. I said, I want to be near this man. I want the influences that he can uh, give the theater. I think it's for me. The group theater was the utopian brainchild of Harold Clerman, Lee Strasberg, and Cheryl Crawford, a family of actors to mirror the family of man. Life, said Clerman, cannot be lived except in terms of people together, sure and strong in their togetherness. Clerman's dream became Stella's burden. I expected what I would get if I joined the familiarity, a togetherness, a sense of camaraderie. What I met was a group of strange people from different parts of the world. And it was the damnedest experience of my life. It was like living with strangers for 10 years. Group playwright Clifford Odette ventured the opinion that no Adler could ever be made a group person. I didn't belong in any democratic situation. I didn't like any aspects of it, neither the clothes or the ideas or the way they dressed or their diction. I simply am an individual. And her individual qualities led to a number of unique performances that electrified Broadway. Stella convinced her brother Luther to join the group. They performed brilliantly together despite their frequent quarrels. Clerman remembers that their curtain calls amused and terrified the company because between bows they turned on each other to resume their cat and dog fights. She also had heated battles with her director Lee Strasberg, who developed an acting method based on his understanding of Stanislavski's principles. The central disagreement, I would say, that the theater exists 99% through the facility of the imagination. And Mr. Strasberg insisted that that was secondary. Strasberg was adamant. Stella must develop her roles by exploring emotional memories from her own personal past. I didn't want to think of when was I moved by uh, my, my sister when she vomited. I, <laughs> I didn't like that whole thing. I wanted to be in the dramatic sense of the author and the author's characters. And I fought Strasbourg like hell. In 1934, Stella went to Paris. 
She met Stanislavski by chance and accused him of ruining her joy of acting. They took an afternoon stroll in the Bois de Bologna where he was surprised to learn that Americans were still using emotional memory, a technique he had abandoned years earlier. He took me under his wing and together with the secretary, we worked for weeks on clarifying what Mr. Stanislavski understood was being uh, made into a kind of mystery in America. I don't think he wanted that. Inspired by this passionate young American, Stanislavski outlined his current theories and confirmed Stella's belief in imagination, not emotional memory, as the key tool in an actor's art. Her return to New York caused an uproar. So she came flying back with this message. Well, you can imagine the actors hearing this, because this is now coming from the horse's mouth. And it said, Stella asks, Stanislavski answers. There was no improvisation about it. It was factual. It was thoroughly investigated. It was like a breath of fresh air. You can imagine that we didn't have to worry all the time about, you know, this emotional memory stuff. And I think it was then that Strasbourg retired from the group theater. In 1935, Awake and Sing was a group theater triumph, as well as a trial by fire. Strasbourg withdrew to develop what came to be known as the method, giving Clerman his first chance to direct. The play's message, that life isn't printed on dollar bills, is expressed by an unhappy family torn by disintegrating values. Stella refused to play the unglamorous role of Bessie Berger, a woman of 50, until Clerman suggested that she might not be able to do it. She was very funny, as well as mean, as she was supposed to be in the part. But she hated one thing more than anything else, and that was the fact that she had to make up old when she was a beautiful woman, uh, not anywhere near Bessie Berger's age, and uh, that people would think that that was her, especially when they'd come backstage and say, are you Luther's mother? She wanted to kill them because there was one year's difference in their age. Stella has been quoted as saying, it was not a barrel of laughs being in the group. It was not fun. It was not music, not painting, not culture. It was deep. It was as though someone had discovered an underworld. Very good. The interesting thing is that she did her greatest acting in the group theater. And she was one of the best actresses in the group theater, even though she did not feel that she belonged there. In 1937, Hollywood called, and Stella answered, to a new last name, Artler. I had this long controversy with them, and at last, I remember, I said, well, if I can pronounce it, you can spell it any way you like. Hello, boys, and thank you. Miss Craven, I don't know of anyone I am so happy to see. Oh, that darling little dog of yours, Miss Grinnish. He is a darling, isn't he? Oh, excuse me. Did you say hello to Sam for me? Not only hello, but Skull, Prozit, and Harley. <laughs> well, thank you. How grand it is to see you looking so well. You mustn't believe everything you see, Mr. Jones. <laughs> this is a great pleasure, Linda. This is all mine, Buzzy. Be seated, gentlemen, and just relax. I don't think I can help you. You see, I hardly knew Mr. Barrow. Oh. Well, you didn't miss much. He wasn't exactly one of the nature's noblemen. Really? Oh. Well, how nice. Hmm. A comedian doesn't have any fragrance. He doesn't need any around you. I'm glad you like my perfume. She was a lady to start with. Very elegant. And then she turns around and she really, really shows the worst side of her, which is a gun mall, and you say dirty words. And I like that twist in it. Why the detour? None of your business. I'm not on trial. Not yet. That's what I deserve for letting a double crossing cop in the door. Get out. Uh, Get out. 
Thanks for the camellia. And don't come back. Don't look now, but your accent's showing. Mrs. Faludi! Mrs. Faludi! Yes? I'm home. Denick is home. I heard already. It's not your home till you pay the rent. Oh, now, Mrs. Faludi, is that a way to greet a man who's been away for three months, who's been longing for your cooking all this time, who's been thinking of you every mm. minute? The rent, the rent you owe me since last spring. Three months the room has been empty. Did I ever get a letter from you, a, a word from you? I sent you a postcard, didn't I? How could I send you a letter? How could I? What would your fiancé think? Uh, you still got the same one. Which one was it when you were here? Uh, Rudolph. No. Huh? No. No. The next Mr. Faludi's name is, uh, Emil. Oh. Mm. He's got his own barber shop. I oh, used a Hungarian accent, and I used Hungarian motions. And I was so busy, and the director finally said, Stella, it isn't only your play. I mean, if you tone down a little bit, we'll let you be in the picture, but you're just taking over. And then I'll not only pay you the rent, but will you get a present? Mm, smoocher. <laughs> <laughs> the 1940s was a period of flowering. By the end of the decade, Stella's restless spirit would find a home. From the time her father first presented her on stage, she had traveled a journey that would lead to her greatest role, as a teacher. But first, she made her farewell to Broadway in a drama and a comedy that confirmed her status as a grand dame of the American theater. In those days, it was sort of fashionable for the leading lady to arrive a little late to show who she was, like 20 minutes. After about an hour and 20 minutes, Stella arrived, looking absolutely beautiful with a great hat with quivering feathers all around it and long black gloves and making gestures of pretending that she wasn't trying to disturb anybody. I told her who I was and she looked at me with this beautiful blue eye and held my hand. If Stella likes you, it's difficult to get your hand back, you know, she holds on to it. And uh, she spoke the first words I ever heard her speak. She said, are you Jewish? When the Allies liberated the concentration camps, they found shocking evidence of Hitler's final solution. Homeless, the Jews who survived languished in displaced persons camps. Like her father before her, Stella answered the call of her people. As a freedom fighter, she went to Europe and helped secure passage for 750 Jews. By train from Frankfurt, by boat from Marseille, and on to Palestine. Back home, she brought her passion for people, for life, and for the theater into the classroom. In 1949, she opened an acting studio, which continues today. Okay. It's a lively applause, but I don't trust it. Uh, I think because it's raining, uh, you might be a little bit... Uh, protected by scarves and sweaters, and so let's scream. Ah! Yes. Okay. Who's shy? Come over and shake my hand. There. Now. And look at these people and tell them what you've done. Come on. Now. <laughs> You see where the shyness comes in? My work is mostly to give the actor a confidence in himself, a confidence which nothing can shatter. I, mean, I, I live now with the birds in Hollywood. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that. I didn't mean that. I mean, it is, it's a, it's a sanctuary there. I must tell you, I mean, if you want to learn how to be free, Listen to the birds, and they'll find... Out, 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 the tiniest thing is out. The court record was good enough... Now, my success in my field has been to allow and to see that the person achieved a self. Anybody that knows my father... Okay, I'm going to stop the scene. It's too passive. It's much too passive. It has nothing to do with acting. It has to do with the reading of lines. Now, I would say 
in the play, you say, my father was a weakling. But there's nobody acting weaker than you. You are playing your own timidity, which is very bad for the part and very bad for the play. The momentum of the scene has to be theatrical, theater. The, the soul of the people that are playing has to have to, have to go. I say, the only thing it is, is that you act with your soul. You do not act words, and you do not act this. You act with your soul, and you don't have that soul yet. You don't, and that's why you want to be an actor. I don't blame you. That's why you all want to be actors. Because your souls are not used up by life. I remember the first class, she said, you must listen with your blood. I thought, oh my God, you know? And she said, you have a huge responsibility in life to take life in completely, you know? And uh, so I started then. I started listening so hard that, you know, I, it hurt. I was a working class girl from Australia who never read a book, who, who, who hadn't heard classical music. I mean, I, I think my family read Zane Grey detective stories. And Stella opened a whole world of knowledge. The actor has in him the memory of everything he's ever touched or tasted or eaten. And he is, by nature, gifted with memory. He can go very far back. And he does go very far back. And under very simplified circumstances, you can urge him to extend himself. Now, you heard that knock, and you had no reaction to it. I need more reaction. Much more, darling. One thousand times more. I heard somewhere that you came from some background of Italian background. <laughs> yes. Well, for God's sakes, you know that no background is lost. No background is lost. So for God's sakes, never mind the blue eyes and never mind the fine thing. Uh, I want the Italian in you. That's where the acting is, the Italian in the American. The American actor has pushed his feelings down to such a level that it is almost impossible for him to uh, arouse himself to the force and the dynamic that you have to use as an actor. She called me a Gentile once, and <laughs> I think it was the worst thing she ever said. She said, darling, you're so, you're so wasp, you're so boring. You've got to get some Italian in you, some Irish in you, get, get Jewish. A sign in her studio says, Stella would like all actors to know that her criticism is not personal. Nothing in the theater is personal. Theater is for the world. There's always a controversy, who's right in a modern play. But in a Shaw play, he knows what's right. He tells you who's right. And you're playing it against somebody who is wrong. And wrong is wrong, and right is right. And you're playing it as right and wrong are the same. And so we don't get any kind of uh, aspect of what you really want to tell them about how wrong they are and how right you are. It's not heroic enough. Now an English actress doesn't need all that. She doesn't need that much explanation. She says, I can live on bread. Good enough, sweetheart. Good enough. <laughs> When have I asked for more? <laughs> great. Great. Don't knock it. Don't that, but we can't do it. So you've got to do something else. You've got yeah. to know what the heroic is, and you've got to know Shaw, and you have to have that stardom in you that says, I, the name of the play is St. Joan, and I can't be a kid. There is a very good story around that long time ago that I went into... Uh, Tiffany and bought some, you know that story. Yes, it's, it's a very good story. And I uh, bought something 
and the lady said, uh, where should we send it in England? I said, uh, oh, I don't live in England. They said, I, I, I thought you were English. I said, no, just affected. <laughs> Come here, darling. Stay there. Speak to her and make her realize the technique of being a queen. Now you are speaking to her without uh, guiding her awakening her to this technique of governing which is masculine which is strong which is don't it's not going to help you uh, she says I too now what you must realize is that every queen is brought up educated to rule they are not educated to be girls you will never govern, Mary. You will never govern, Mary! Oh. <laughs> if you want my love, you shall have it freely when I am free. You will never govern, Mary. If I let you go back to Scotland, there will be long broils again, dangers and right ones to my peace and... More! To be fair to my own people, this must not be. Colors, but colors, colors, lots of colors. Up and down and there and now, darling, you must realize a star plays Elizabeth. She was a star. She was queen. Now, you're playing, you're playing the wa lady in waiting. There is no age for an actress. There is no age. You have to have it. You have to be able to produce it. You have to have that tone that you give her. You can't always do this, because I'll kill you. So what's the good of it? And who will rule in my place? Why, who rules now? Your brother. He rules by son. Yes, but all this could be arranged, or so I'm told, if your son will crown king and Moray made regent. All right. Every one of her arguments is stupid. Stupid. Right. Walk away from her. Stupid. You're stupid. You'll do as I say. You don't always have to face her. You'll do as I say. I want to stop with all this nonsense. Oh, well. Now we have some more of this stupid uh, feminine thinking. Finish with that. I was standing still because I felt more powerful standing in one place than moving around. I felt like I don't know. Really? I'm not kidding. She's like, I have fun of my piano teacher. And I'm playing da, 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 di. He says, faster, faster. <laughs> I, I, I can't go so fast. Just a moment. Stop coughing. No actor coughs. They don't sneeze and they don't uh, they don't catch colds. They're not tired. They don't yawn and they don't chew gum. <laughs> so, I told you in the beginning that no matter what I said, you wouldn't listen. You would go to the words. You are drunk with words. With, you are infected. You are diseased with words. Instead of what words come from. You must contribute to the words. The words are not your privilege. The words are somebody else's. You must do something with them. You must give them life. They are on the page. Shakespeare is dead as doornails on the page. The play has nothing to do with words. Nothing at all to do with words. It has to do with ideas. That's what plays are about. Plays where you don't dance, and you don't amuse the audience, and you don't wiggle, and you don't shake. And it's not right there. It's not absolutely com comprehensible, not even to you. Those are the parts, that's what you call the, the big theater. 
That's what you gotta work for. I myself know you to be an eater of dust. Leave me here and set me lower this year by year as you promised to the last is an oomlet and my name inscribed on the four winds. Still, still I win. I have been a woman and I have loved as a woman loves, lost as a woman loses. I have borne a son and he will rule Scotland and England. Come, turn the key. I have a hell for you in mind where you burn and feel it, live where you live and so.